Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the latest episode of the Stephen King Podcast. This is bonus episode number 35, and I have with me today Tony Russo, who is a releasing his first book, though he has a writing background. You are a reporter by trade, correct? Yes. I've been a journalist since, I like to say, for the better part of the 21st century, because I think that sounds cool. <laughs> Very good. It sounds better than 15 years, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So let's let uh, the audience know a little bit about you, uh, who you are, where where you are. And uh, I see that you're also a podcaster. So why don't you tell us all about that fun stuff? Sure. Well, I'm, I, as I said, a journalist by trade. I'm living and working on Maryland's Eastern Shore, but I'm originally from Ocean, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> near Ocean City, Maryland, but I'm originally from New Jersey. And I've been hosting, I, I did, you know, I was a regular news reporter and early on I realized that podcasting was going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing culture and news podcasts since about 2007. Included in them are Beer with Strangers, which is a show about beer and travel. And then oh, also, cool. and then Day Drinking on Del Marva, which is a story, which is a podcast about culture and life on the Del Marva Peninsula where I live. It's a it's not a national podcast because if you don't, you know, it's 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 a it's a locally focused podcast. Okay, and where's where's this peninsula located? Sorry. Uh, the, so the Delmarva Peninsula was is creatively named because it connects Delaware with Virginia. So okay. it's the top of it is Delaware, the middle of it is Maryland, and the bottom of it of it is Virginia. Oh, cool. And Chesapeake Bay is to our, if you're facing north, to our left, and the Atlantic Ocean is to our right. So we okay. are kind of a cutout on the ah. eastern seaboard. At just below New Jersey, there are like two cutouts. There's the New Jersey cutout, and then there's the and then there's the Delmarva Peninsula cutout, and then further on, further down, there's Outer Banks and things like that. Right. Okay. So before you got into podcasting, though, you were in community journalism. Was your educational background in writing or anything of that nature? Uh, no, I actually, I, I this is always weird. It's always weird to bro brag about multiple undergraduate degrees, <laughs> <laughs> but I have a, I have a degree in history and I have a degree in philosophy. Because I know where the money is. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had wanted to be a. <laughs> my hope was to be a philosophy professor, and the way things worked out, I ended up. I went to college as an older person, so I went when I was thirty. Okay. And so when I when I got out of college, it wasn't going to be possible for me to continue my education. So I just started writing for newspapers because one of the things that you learn to do in history is to read a lot of boring things and try to make them less boring. <laughs> right. And and in philosophy is to, to read a lot of complicated things and try to make them a little bit more clear. Mm. And so journalism was a good fit for me. Plus, you know, it allowed me, I have children, so it allowed me to work around my kids' schedules and things like that. Right. Okay. So from a craft perspective then as a community journalist, did you, how did you make that, how did you start that? Because did, did you, were you able to write articles right away or was that a learning process for you or? Well, yeah, no, I was able to write articles pretty, pretty quickly. I, uh, I just, you know, I've, I've been an avid reader and writer for my whole life. Okay. And when you read enough, I, I don't need to tell anyone who's listening to this show, <laughs> but when you read enough eventually the narrative sense just kind of imprints upon you. Right. And so when you can see a story, you can see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And then all you have to do is find the premise. And so you find the premise, you see how it goes, and then you have the theme and pow. What was great about being a reporter is nothing will cure you of writer's block like the distance between the next word and the next paycheck, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yep. And if you don't want to write or if you're not in the mood, that's fine, but no one's going to pay you. So <laughs> since I was earning my living as a reporter, I learned that if you sit down and start typing, eventually something okay will come out and then you can work with that. Right. And so it just, I was able to be pretty prolific as a newspaper reporter. And I had started that when I was a when I was a student, I'd written a lot about the history. As it turns out, I was a beer. I have two smaller books out on craft beer. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, my history background, I looked into the rise of beer um, in Maryland in the 1600s. And so that gave me 
background for the long form. Mm -hmm. And so when I got my first, I mean, I had done, I had started as a stringer at a local newspaper. So like literally like covering the school board. Okay. And, uh, and <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I just remembered how awful that was when I said it out loud. Yeah. But you know, when you cover this, covering the school board, um, I got the opportunity to also do features. So, you know, okay. Sally wins the pageant and then I'm like, all right, Sally. And then I do a story about Sarah, Sally and her family. And so that's how I learned to turn the news into something a little bit longer and more narrative. Mm -hmm. And th that helped going forward once I started writing longer things right. and a uh, more in-depth thing. Okay, cool. I, it would be remiss of me if I didn't highlight, I should, sorry, I should have done this off the top, that the, what Tony's here to talk about today is this nonfiction book titled Dragged Into the Light, which is a nonfiction book about the Sherry Schreiner cult, I guess. I'm, uh, I got to be honest, I've never heard of this person until you that, contacted that's me. Okay. So, but there's reading what I did about her. It's, it's, she seems like a very common template for a lot of other cults. And I'm sure we'll get into that because I am curious what attracted you to her. But before we do that, you have one other thing in your bio that I'm interested in. And that is you did a podcast in 2017 called This Is War. Yes. Which was a narrative podcast about combat veteran experience. So why don't you talk a little bit, a bit about that? I I would love to. It's kind okay. It's weird and rare to know that you've already done your best work, like your most important work. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is war was that. And there are some flaws I will admit to. Like my voice isn't my voice isn't predictable <laughs> on the show. Okay. But what I did have the opportunity to do was to interview about 50, maybe more, maybe, maybe somewhere along the lines of 70 combat veterans from mm. Iraq and Afghanistan. And I would, when I could convince them, I would take their story and turn it into a, a, a like a biographical show. And what I would always tell people is it's like, I structured it like a magazine article mm -hmm. where I say all the boring stuff. And then the interesting stuff is quotes from the subject. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's audio, so you can hear it. Right. And I think people still, if people still like it today. I still get, I still get emails about it. Mm -hmm. I still get people who are asking, you know, is it ever coming back? It, it ended up getting canceled after two seasons, but mm. it was the first professional podcast job I had. Right. And, and it really just gave me such a particular insight into the, the art. Mm -hmm. Because everyone's arc is kind of the same. You go to high school, you go to the army or the Marines or the Navy, mm -hmm. you go to war, and then you come home and you try and deal with it. Right. But the details of each of the stories are so gripping. Mm -hmm. um, even, even the least, quote, gripping, unquote, interview just tells you so much about what it was like to be essentially a 20 year old kid in the desert mm. fighting for your life for four years or right. whatever. If you can, the, the problem is that it is really heavy. Right. I, I think that the end of the, at the end of the day, I think what undid the show was it was heavy. Like my family has told me, you know, we like the show, but it's not something you can listen to. Mm -hmm. Like no one's binging this show. You know, <laughs> it, it's right. it's one that you often finish with tears in your eyes, whether you like it or not. I mean, yeah. sometimes I'd come out of my my office like all red faced, and my right. wife would be like, oh, "That's another bad one." I would interview the the veterans for about three hours. Right. They, we'd get them a, a recording studio, and we would just talk for about three hours, and then I'd edit it down to a forty minute, really tight narrative about their career. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very, very proud of it. Yeah. Like I said, it's not easy to listen to. Mm -hmm. But if it's not easy to listen to, then maybe we should think about that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> but yeah. in the future, as we decide whether or not something's important enough to ruin a young life over. And sometimes it is. And mm -hmm. they are, even the most disenchanted is terribly proud of the decision they made to go right. and the way they comported themselves. Yeah. And so it's, it's upful. I try to, I try to make it upful. Yeah. <laughs> Hopeful and uplifting. Yeah. But it's, can be, it can be heavy. So. I bet. Um, yeah. Un unfortunately in today's culture, which is so clickbait driven, this type of show 
just wouldn't have the traction that other things do because people just consume media and it goes in and out so quickly. And unfortunately, it reinforces a lot of, to my mind, social media reinforces a lot of stereotype type mindsets that unfortunately, if you get the people together on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and even if they're from polar opposite uh, viewpoints, there's a lot of common ground that social media cuts away between the two. And I think that's what we're, we're losing a, a, a lot today. And this type of programming helps, would help bring that back because if you, it doesn't matter, like if you're, whatever your political viewpoint is, if you've got a son or a daughter and they come home from something and they're messed up, the, all that other stuff that people f are fighting about nowadays is meaningless. It's the people and people generally really do want to talk to each other, I think. And so uh, I commend you for that. That couldn't have been easy to do. And because like a lot of the arcs are probably still open, right? These people are still on their journey. So we don't know. There are some guys that I'll just touch base with every now and again. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm helping one gentleman who got in touch with me after the show had been canceled. And I think we're going to write his biography no, cool. slash war memoir together. He was just among the other thing, among the things he was, the, the, this is my big pitch for the book when, when I get, when I get a chance to make it. Mm -hmm. He was among the uh, soldiers that grabbed up Saddam Hussein. Mm. And that is probably the least interesting thing about it. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, okay. he's just a real special guy. Right. And, and he's finding himself now after after his career trying to trying to come to terms with how he can help other people by sharing his story okay. is essentially the, the bottom cool. line on that. Okay, so that's 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 a pretty heavy subject, but I, I thought it was uh, <laughs> definitely worth uh, mentioning because that type of programming is pretty rare nowadays, unfortunately. So um, that's good that you did that. Now, the other thing that we're going to talk about, which is why you're here, is, is your new book, Dragged Into the Light. This it may not be as the same kind of heavy, but this kind of cult stuff is, uh, I, it, it seems to be becoming more and more prevalent. So I'm curious how you found out about this person and what attracted you to them and what motivated you to want to write this book about her and the cult. Well, so after This Is War ended, I just needed another, another thing to write about. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is weird about this so I jumped from like trying to do journalism to doing this is war. Mm -hmm. And that gave me the opportunity to do a lot more long form things. And it also gave me a chance to see how how things worked. And when this story was over, I realized I just had to find another story to tell. Okay. It was as simple as that. It's like if you want to keep working, then you have to find something to write about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and someone, uh, a colleague of mine literally said like, have you seen this Sherry Schreiner lizard thing? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I haven't. And she's like, you should look at it. Okay. <laughs> and that was pretty much, that, uh, oh, okay. that was pretty much it. Actually at the beginning, Sherry's story wasn't the one that interested me. Mm. I was trying to write a different story altogether, but then through a series of weird coincidences, I got this huge file with all of this information in it. And it it changed things. It changed what I was able to do. Mm. And that shaped the, the rest of the story. The brief story, the pitch, and I guess, as you said, I probably should have said this in the beginning. The, the brief story goes like this. So Sherry Schreiner had an internet cult and she believed in all of the conspiracies I think except for the flat earth. I don't think flat earthing. I mean, she hated flat earth people, but everything else she believed in. Okay. Um, and she, well, I don't think she believed in any of it, but certainly she preached okay. about it. Do you want to give us, a, you want to give a laundry list of what those things are? Oh, so the reptilian conspiracy. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there are people who believe that the rich and powerful are actually lizards in disguise. Okay. <laughs> I haven't heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, so the reptilian conspiracy, the uh, NWO, which is a new world order, mm -hmm. which is run by these lizard people. And they're the ones who decide who gets rich and famous, who becomes president, things like that. Okay. Now, for Sherry, this is all part of a view of Christianity. So she is a Christian. She's not mm. a reptilian. You know, she was a, a Baptist as a kid, and then she realized that you know, the Baptist church wasn't, didn't understand. They weren't telling the truth about really what was going on. Okay. And so she set out on her own preacher journey. And along the way, she picked up a lot of followers and she had a lot of influence. And one of those followers, his name was Stephen Minio. And he was 
absolutely a hundred percent behind Sherry in all things. And hmm. he was he was a strict follower. He would send her he would send her money, but he would also promote her and make videos for her and do lots of work for her to help promote her ministry. Now Stephen certainly would have been at the January 6th insurrection had he been alive at the time. Okay. Spoilers, Stephen's not alive anymore. Okay, is Sherry? Uh, Sherry is not either. That's ah. also a huge spoiler Oh, because both in the book and in the documentary about it, we pull that punch to the end. Okay. Only because the, the story of her death is not as interesting as the story of her life. Okay. But so- Do you want me to cut this out of the podcast? Oh, no, not at all. No? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I, I mean, by, by the time, I mean, everyone knows Sherry's dead. If you're interested enough to look, mm. anyone who's interested enough to look, it's one of the first things you see about her. It's just narratively, you know, when, when you're, right. I mean, if you wrote a story about like, JFK, you like, you end with the assassination, right? right? No, nobody, <laughs> everyone knows, <laughs> yeah. everyone knows how it ends. Everybody knows the, the Titanic sinks. How do you get yeah. to the end? Yeah. 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 Okay. So what, what's the time period that we're talking about here? Oh, this happened in 2006. 17. And I just want oh, to catch up my okay. last thread. Okay. So Stephen Minio started dating this woman named Barbara Rogers and Sherry didn't like her. Mm. So Sherry said that Barbara was a vampire and a witch and a super soldier <laughs> and that she was going to kill Stephen. Mm. And Stephen said, no, you're a liar and a false prophet. And they had this flame war on the internet mm. that went on for about two months. And then one night, Barbara put a gun to Stephen's head and the gun went off. And so the question is, you know, did I mean, Sherry said, I'm a prophet and I told you that this was a vampire. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's kind of how she makes her living. But then the other question is, did Barbara how much participation did Stephen and Barbara have in Stephen's death? Was it a murder? Was it a suicide? Was it an accidental shooting? Mm. And that's the again, spoilers. I don't resolve that. I, I have my I have my own opinion. Mm -hmm. I uh, I don't know. The only person who knows what happened in the room that night, obviously, is Barbara. And I don't think she was all the way there. I think that she had checked out by the time the gun went off. OK, but we'll. But we'll we'll see if, if you if you read the book and you, we'll see if I give you enough evidence for that. But. Sure. OK, so what was the mandate or objective of this cult? Were they planning to overthrow the government or they were or was no. this strictly a sham and she was milking people for money? Or like, what, what? Well, I, I think it was just strictly a sham and she was milking people for okay. money. But this was a doomsday cult. OK, so they were preparing at all times for the end of the world. And what did they have a, a date on that? Soon. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. But what was really compelling about it was the reptilian conspiracy. It's funny because I've just said it to you now. If anyone who hasn't heard of the reptilian conspiracy except from me, you will hear about it again in the next two weeks. It's one of those things where once you mm -hmm. once you know it's out there, right. all of a sudden you see it all over the place. Right. So one of the things about the reptilian conspiracy is they would go and, quote, fight, unquote, reptilians in the woods. Okay. They had this magical stone <laughs> called Orgone and Organite, which again, something you can look up and once you see it, you're like, oh yes, I've seen that before. So Organo Organite killed these, these monsters and they would go out and they would have, they would claim to have battles with these reptilians in, in the woods, among other things. And one of the things that happened after I had finished the book, but soon enough that I was able to include it in the introduction, was that's what the um, Nashville bomber, the Nashville Christmas bomber was doing. He he believed in all of these same things. Okay. And that's why I wrote the book the way I wrote it. This, is, this isn't a book about crazy people going crazy. This is a book about a culture dying poorly. Mm. But the crazy people going crazy is why Stephen King was an important part because I got an understanding from him not personally mm -hmm. about how that about how that might unfold okay and that was from what and that was from the uh, a novella he wrote called the ballad of the F flexible bullet right there is one of the key parts of the story is about demonic possession mm -hmm. and so they believe and this is not exclusive to sherry it's actually quite common among right-leaning, not even extreme right, among right-leaning 
religious Christian evangelicals, this idea that there's no such thing as a mental health disorder and there's no such thing as addiction. Mm. They are the manifestations of demonic possession and they believe that. And what that means is that if you are mentally ill or if you are are struggling with even depression. Mm -hmm. That is a, a demon that has possessed you. Right. And so they they believe more in exorcism than they do in medical care. Okay. This is what I'm getting at. Right. But they see the world, they see a different reality than we see. And that's the other point in my book is that we we don't have two they, they talk about the two Americas. There's the two I think there are two American realities. I think that mm -hmm. if there are people when there are people walking around saying you are a possessed person, they're not I don't know if it's right to say they're crazy. Like mm. of, for example, according to the what DSM four, right? The the diagnostic psychologists, mm -hmm. they have what is delusional and they have a list of all the things that are delusional and it's it's something that can't be demonstrated. It's something that you have never seen. And the only thing that makes, the only thing that exempts religion from this idea of delusion, and not to say all religious people are delusional, but the only <laughs> thing that exempts religion from this, delu from this idea of delusion is it's something that a lot of, that it's something that no one else or very few other people believe. Mm -hmm. And so it's not right to say that they're delusional when they say that, according to their religion, I'm possessed by a reptilian. Mm -hmm. That that doesn't meet that it doesn't meet the criteria because lots of people believe that. Mm -hmm. And coming to terms with people who truly believe they're occupying a different reality was so hard for me. Mm -hmm. And I was driving my daughter out west and listening to books on tape. And I was listening to, I, I really prefer short stories and novellas to, to anything anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I had Skeleton Crew, which is the version I heard on it. Okay. And, and I listened to it and I'd heard it again. It, it, had been, it had been a book that I'd returned to over and over, but I forgot about a key passage. And once I heard it, mm -hmm. it just changed my whole way of thinking. Okay. Do you know what that passage oh. is or can you paraphrase it? Oh, I would be it? happy to share okay. it. Thank you for asking. So, <laughs> so the book is, uh, the, 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 the book is a story about an editor who is telling a story of one of his writers who had lost his mind. Mm -hmm. And he says, madness is a flexible bullet. And that's where the title comes from. But he describes madness in such clear tones that it's it's unshakable and what he says is he says in a, a, there's a place in our mind where there's a white room and there's a revolver on the table and you go into that every time you go out the door and you see a ladder and you're like well it's just as safe to not walk under a ladder as it is to walk under a ladder and you walk around the ladder you open the door and walk in and pick up that gun but then you get past the ladder, you put the gun back down and, and then you walk back out. And that's when that's the twang with madness, this idea that, well, yeah, you know, it's just it's superstition, but it doesn't matter. And again, this is the analogy that that King's character is given. It's it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. He says, so the next step, of course, is you start writing letters to the newspaper <laughs> saying that these ladders are a menace because people are walking under them and there's just bad luck all around. Right. And then the next step is you go driving around town, knocking down ladders to protect people right. from the awful bad luck of ladders. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what happens in my book. And my book was a lot of the way done when I heard it. But once I heard this, mm -hmm. it made it made my theme come out for me a lot more. Right. And then I was able to... I was able to adjust it. The The closing line of that story is, I believe all of us are holding on to our sanity by a greased rope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, that's probably much more true <laughs> today than ever before. <laughs> and it, it was so, if, you, if anyone who has listened to this hasn't revisited that story recently, I can't encourage you enough. Yeah. I mean, you can't pick up a Stephen King short story and go wrong, but this one... It really gets it because this is I, I don't know. if So Fornets are a big theme in this as well. And Fornets 
are these luck elves mm-hmm. that live in a typewriter. And that's something that you're going to see in, you know, one out of eight Stephen King stories is going to be something living in a typewriter <laughs> or in a word processor. Yeah. That element of the story, of course, is dated because if he had r- written this later, he would have obviously go- gone to in- internet forums as opposed to sending letters to the newspaper. But right. In a nutshell, that story is basically the belief that insanity is a sort of a flexible bullet. It will eventually kill, but how long this process takes and how much damage the bullet does before the victim finally dies are impossible to predict. So yeah, that sounds like that's the theme of your book, because we know that the principal players are did come to bad ends. <laughs> yes. At the end of the story, you know, Barbara goes to jail. Stephen is dead. Stephen, I mean, Stephen dies on page one. It's really not, it's really not a shock. Mm-hmm. But what's, I think, what what I think is worth considering about the book is the process. And mm-hmm. I think this idea about how easy it is and how nebulous it is. One of Sherry's followers had committed suicide, a young woman. She was 22 years old uh, when she killed herself. And everyone was saying, well, this was a troubled girl who believed, you know, in reptiles. And of course, she's going to kill herself. And I'm like, it's it's not as simple as that. Mm. She didn't wake up one day and say, I believe in reptiles. You know, right. This was this was a this was a woman who she thought that she was an, an angel and she felt like she had to act like one. So she's running around town like doing errands, like good, good deeds and Everybody would say, well, well, there's nothing wrong with her. Look, she's happy. She's doing good deeds. She's helping people. But she was doing them out of this terror that she wasn't living up to her faith. And it broke her. Mm. <laughs> and when you look at it that way, it, it, that's the, again, that's the whole flexible bullet aspect of it. Right. It's like, yes, you know, God wants you to do good things. Mm-hmm. And God doesn't like it when you do bad things. And for the vast majority of us, that's enough. Mm-hmm. We picked that. We picked the gun up. We're like, God doesn't like us to be bad, and He likes us to be good, and we put it down. But then some people are like, God will hate us if we're bad, and only love us if we're good all the time. And then every slip is some sort of like divine betrayal. Mm-hmm. And and again, when you believe that you are surrounded by demons and you're trying to save everyone at the end of the world, which is what this, you know, young woman was trying to do, it can take a toll and it can take us, it can take an invisible toll. And it's again, another thing from Ballad of the Flexible Bullet, once he got the cure, which was confirmation that there really was a fornit living in his typewriter, he became sane. (laughs) You know, he turned off all the electricity in his house, which was a little kooky, but, and (laughs) again, this is Reg Thorpe in the book. This is not from my book, but he... He leveled out. And the same thing happened with this young woman I was talking about. Once she started wearing her orgo necklace all the time, she felt it protected her from the demons that surrounded her. Mm. It made it easier for her to go forward. But the thing was, she was, again, slipping away and no one was noticing it because they were deceived, you know, deceived by her upbeat attitude. Right, right. Sounds very timely, especially given things in the States with... (laughs) The recent election and uh, the number of people that believe that it was a stolen election. Absolutely. And then you have the main defense lawyer coming up and saying that she was lying the whole time <laughs> because she didn't think anybody would believe her. So it's kind of <laughs> like, yeah, so this sounds very timely. Now, so your friend pointed her, uh, Sherry Schreiner, out to you. And, and then with the Stephen King flexible bullet, you pulled this book together. Did you interview anybody from this cult or? I did okay. at length ah. a couple of people and i don't know if i i hope i did a kind of good job at mm-hmm. getting across how these people i don't like to say these people but there's no other way to put it <laughs> are genuine yeah like i spoke with people i spoke with i spoke with a gentleman who explained to me how these reptile cults come to be. And that wasn't what he was trying to do. Mm -hmm. But one of the themes among a lot of the people who went and followed Sherry Schreiner was that they weren't getting what they needed from their regular churches. Mm. And the great quote that I have from this one gentleman was, 
you know, you can't go to your Baptist pastor and say, you know, hey, what do you know about the lizards running the planet? They don't teach that at seminary. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's funny, but he, yep. he, he yeah. was genuine. Yeah. And what started to emerge is that there are people who have been waiting for the end of the world for too long. Right. And they're worried that first they were worried that God wasn't coming and now they are starting to worry, worry whether he was ever coming. Mm -hmm. And so they have to push themselves into, into these deeper and darker places where it makes sense, okay. where the world makes sense still, even though it hasn't ended yet, like it was supposed to. Right. Some people say 2012, some people say 2011, you know. Right. Okay. Is the Sherry Schreiner cult like, is it still alive today? Has somebody taken over for her or? Oh, it is still alive today and someone has taken over for her. Yeah. And uh, so who's the main player now? Well, I, I've, I've got to say, actually, I'm not going to say only because I'm not 100% sure. Mm. And I had to take a chunk out of my book at the lawyer's request yesterday. Oh, so. <laughs> okay. And it's, inter well, it's interesting because I just, her site is still up. I've just opened up her, her page. Uh, <laughs> is it a Wix page by any chance? Uh, Wix? I don't know. It's www.shareshiner.com. So, uh, oh, yes. She has about 30 websites. Oh, okay. And they're all filled with the same bananas thing. But if you'd like to see the latest on Sherry Schreiner, I believe her family's still running it. I'm not. Okay. I'm 90. Her family's still running it. Yeah. Well, somebody's saying they can join on Patreon <laughs> to, to, yes. to get exclusive content and become a supporter yes. of my work in ministry. So that's the cult is, is still going on. Um, and they're giving updates about why COVID is – what they're doing is – it's fascinating and terrible to see, mm -hmm. but they all right. So Sherry claimed to be Jesus's sister, okay. right? So it was Jesus and Sherry and Lucifer. They were baby angels together before the fall of man when Lucifer had a rebellion. Mm. And then Jesus had to get sent down to die to quash the rebellion or kind of. And okay. And then so Sherry was this was this this final prophet that's come down. And so the people who are running her site have repurposed her old teachings hmm. and saying when COVID came out, they're like they found something about Sherry saying that the Chinese were sending sickness this way. Hmm. And it was just just Sherry said some of the worst, most vile things anyone who's never gone to jail for saying things says. Mm. Alex Jones was really kind of like Sherry Schreiner life. <laughs> okay. So this is a horrible, awful person saying undef indefensible things. Okay. And now her followers are digging them back up and repurposing them to keep her, uh, keep her ministry alive. Okay. So this might seem like a dumb question. What is the purpose of your book? I think the purpose of my book is to encourage people to take this a little bit more seriously. Mm. It's interesting. So the there's a documentary I mentioned, and that's that's a little bit, it's kind of true crimey. Mm -hmm. My book is not even in the true crime section. My, my book is po politics and culture. Okay. I think that we need to take religious claims seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think that the religious among us have a little bit of responsibility to to point out that this isn't sustainable. And I think that all of us need to stop leering at these people like they're crazy mm -hmm. and start worrying about what we can do to make them... The point of... I, I make this, I'm sorry, I, I, the best way to say it is that they're not, not only don't I think they're crazy, I don't think they're wrong. And In what way? Well, the government doesn't care about you and you can't trust it, mm -hmm. right? The church doesn't care about you and you can't trust it. But making up reasons why the government is out to get you or the churches are filled with demons doesn't solve anything. Mm -hmm. You know, how about working to make it so that the government is a little bit more responsible to you, right. you know, so that the churches aren't just fleecing you and that they are providing some sort of ethical and moral 
sustenance right. in in a world that can be hard to be ethical and moral in. Mm -hmm. That's a point well taken. And because, again, just returning to the obvious situation in the States again with this, the Capitol 6, uh, the January 6th Capitol riots and all that, that's showing that there's, there's like multiple people are living in multiple realities. I watched a documentary on Netflix, The Social Dilemma. It's talking about yes, social, I've heard yeah, it. so talking about social media and these social media companies have, they've got these algorithms so that when you search on something, it gives you back responses that fit your history, not the facts. So if, if somebody is a flat earth believer and they type in the world is flat, they're going to get articles, responses that align with their views. Whereas if somebody who doesn't believe in it, they're going to get you know, what we would believe is, is the correct traditional thing, which I find appalling. Like to me, that type of stuff should be factual based. Like if you <laughs> like, you shouldn't be getting answers that fit your worldview. You should be getting answers that are based on fact. Uh, obviously, the, it depends on the subject matter. Some are moral questions as opposed to right objective scientific type questions. But when when people are being fed distorted things, like how can we come together on common ground to to get, uh, to accomplish anything if we're all not sharing the common reference points anymore? Be it religion views, government views, and whatnot, and uh, so I think your book is touching on something that is even a, a bigger issue than what we're seeing with these cults. I, I, I think so. I mean, that was my experience yeah. in, in doing the research about it. Mm -hmm. One of the places where I kind of depart from from the documentary for sure, and I, I want to really address this social dilemma aspect. Mm -hmm. I I had the privilege of getting the court records and... Here's something that I think we might know in our heads, but not in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Anyone who sent Barbara Rogers or Stephen Minio a message between um, March of 2017 and September of 2017 mm -hmm. or July, you know, when, when he died, mm -hmm. I have I have all their information in my computer. Mm. It was part of the court documents. I have newborn photos of people's children. I have gossip between people about other people. Hmm. Anything that they said in a private chat, I also have. Anything they said on Messenger, I also have. I, I have them mm -hmm. because Facebook had them. Yep. And at the risk of, not at the risk of, I'm about to quote myself. <laughs> <laughs> in the book, I say that the internet doesn't breed these monsters any more than a coop breeds pigeons. Mm. You know, we do this. Yeah. Well, um, again, like the, the January 6th situation, how many people posted stuff about themselves on it? Like, I mean, <laughs> like that you're detached from reality if you don't think that that's going to be used against you in a court of law or something like I just just mind blowing that people were posting stuff about themselves doing something so blatantly wrong. So it's like, yeah. it's unbelievable. It, it shows a fundamental misunderstanding about what the internet does. Yeah. But that's also part of you. I'm, I'm always, not you personally, obviously, uh, the part of the collective. Mm -hmm. I'm always wary about when people talk about, you know, free speech on the internet and things like that. It, it's, it's very complicated, mm -hmm. but I've always been a huge fan of Turn it off yep. if it's bad for you. Yep. If something makes you so miserable, mm -hmm. how do you? So I like to drink. I'm not going to lie. I drink a bunch. <laughs> and I see people sometimes like mean drunks. Mm -hmm. I will never, I will live and die and never understand a mean drunk. Yeah. Because I love the taste of whiskey and I love hugging people. And that's great. Yeah. But if you drink whiskey and then you just want to pick a fight, then don't, don't drink whiskey. Exactly. It's not good for you. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want to get on the internet and then when you get off the internet, if you want to hurt people, you just stop going on. Yeah. It's not, it's not required. Yeah. Like there are books. I, I buy a copy <laughs> of Dragged Into the Light and then memorize it, right? You don't have to go onto the internet. So yes, the corporate internet is inherently evil. Mm -hmm. I don't know why anyone thought it would be different. Yeah. I'll, the gas companies also evil, right? Yep. The car companies probably evil. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, you, the lobby, the so, lobby groups in government, absolutely evil, absolutely, right? Yeah. Why, it's weird <laughs> to pretend we're surprised. Yeah, 
you know? Yep. And if we can just change the way we engage and what we expect out of things, yeah, I think that might help. I don't know. It's that old adage, with great power comes great responsibility. So just because you got something doesn't mean you should use it, or you have to use it very judiciously. And the technological sciences are far outstripping our social sciences, uh, sciences at this point, and we really need to do a lot of stepping back, as you, as you just suggested, and, and take a hard look at what we're doing to ourselves with all these tools. And there's nothing wrong with trying to just do more do more canonical reading i'm yep. I, you know i know that the i know that the the canon is is skewed and there's a there's a great you know site of anti canon or new canon books or things like that but the problem is we i'm sorry the problem is like i know one of the things <laughs> that concerns me <laughs> is that we don't evaluate right a lot of the times we're like as you were saying this fits with me and i believe it or this doesn't fit with me and i don't believe it yep you know, and a lot of times we use the opportunity to be mad. Yeah, I've got a pretty, I mean, I've been duped lots of times in my life, but I also like to think I have an okay, you know, bullshit detector. Mm -hmm. And when you hear something and it doesn't sound right, you know, maybe it's not. Yeah. Just, yeah. does that sound weird to you? No, no, I agree let's with look you. In, let's look into it more. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I think all of us have gone down the rabbit holes with the internet. I mean, it's so easy to do because it's click, click, click. It's very simple to yeah to fall into these things. So yeah, I take your advice of stepping back uh, quite a, quite seriously nowadays. And in fact, I really try to just stay on the internet for finding positive things like people praising other people's work and things like that, uh, which I don't think happens enough. And and that never has happened enough since regular news, televised news became part of our 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 Absolutely. social structure. I mean, because it's it's like with fiction, writing about a happy family is boring. You want to he hear the stories right. about families that struggle and that go have to go through hardships and that because that's interesting. And and unfortunately, all the media that we have nowadays is is geared towards that. But if you step away from it and talk to your neighbors and just go for a walk in the park and you you see that the, the all those small little good things that are boring to write about, but are fundamental to human existence and, and well-being are they're still happening. And so it, yeah, it's a conundrum that we're going to be struggling with for a while because uh, we're just, because it's so, it's so enticing the, the, te the technology that we have nowadays, but it's also very distancing. Social distancing it was happening before COVID really. So, <laughs> you know, uh, anyhow, before we get too philosophical here, I just want to pull back to get to some uh, hard facts about your book. Uh, when is it due? Any any minute now. I, I just okay. want to I just want to quick tag up on the one thing you said because sure. I wanted to mention the flexible bullet one more time. Okay. Because Stephen King could use the plug. Yeah, um, exactly. Poor guy. One of the things that the editor says there's he resolves a plot hole this way, which I love. He said there there is no answer to this question, and he said that's the good thing about a true story. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> you don't have to, you don't have to say why things happen. Like in fiction, you have to say why things happen. Yeah. In, in nonfiction, you just say that they happened and let the reader figure out why. Yeah. <laughs> and, and of course he said it in a work of fiction, but it also helped with my own plot holes. Like mm -hmm. there are some things that are not going to be answered. Yeah. And you have to kind of be okay with that because that's life. <laughs> that's life. Yeah, <laughs> you know it's 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 messy. But anyway, yeah. So my book is available. I think if it's not available for mm -hmm. pre-order this minute, it should be available for pre-order pretty soon. Okay. And where would they go to find that out? Go to draggedintothelight.com. Okay. That's my book website. It's got a picture of the book on it, mm -hmm. and you can link to either be on a mailing list for notification when the uh, hard covers are available for pre-order okay you can go and i think right now this very second you can order it on amazon the epub and the trade paperback i think are going to be on amazon any minute now okay but certainly after november uh, may 25th it will be out for all right you to get in your hands and where can people find you if they want to visit your site or listen to your podcast yep everything you everything about me you probably can find on by tony russo.com that's by B Y B Y T O N Y R U S S O dot com. All right. Um, like my Very byline. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't want to go on. Okay. 
<laughs> well, I, I had it easy. I, I'll never shut up. I had to resist yeah, the temptation. Uh, that's okay. I uh, quite enjoyed having you on. I wish you all the best luck with your book. And yeah, we got into some heavy stuff that hopefully didn't drag people down. But, uh, you know, it's just stuff that we all should be aware of. And hopefully your book will help in some small way with uh, that. And yeah, we'll just uh, be vigilant, everybody. Be vigilant. <laughs> all right, Tony, thanks a lot for coming on. All right. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Not a problem. You take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Goodbye.